What up, what up, what up? I'm Brand Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with episode number 32 of No Labels Necessary Podcast, where you can catch us every Tuesday, every Thursday on Apple Music, Spotify, YouTube, here on YouTube, of course, where we got it started. Anywhere that you listen to your podcast, where we talk about cash, content, and music, entrepreneurship. Oh, of course, with that music industry lens, because that's what we do, y'all. Now, as always, we like to start off with a little bit of advice. And today, the advice is coming from a very interesting place, because I got a question for you, right? Not releasing music. Mm. Is it stupid? Is it stupid not to release music? Because that's what this guy thinks. Yeah, we're about to find out. All right. So let's <laughs> let's look at the perspective on it before y'all judge. All right. DJ Payne One. Shout out to DJ Payne One. Uh, let's switch up that perspective. People get so upset when you tell them to put beats, songs, and content out consistently. Mm-hmm. They cry. Quality over quantity. Take your time. We know damn well, producers. Recording artists paralyze themselves with the illusion of perfection. Not releasing music is stupid. All right. Okay. All right. I think I think now with a little bit more context, I can agree with that situation. Okay. Like in what way? And artists, producers, credits in general are really getting themselves over, like he said, that illusion of perfection. Because mm-hmm. I think the the caveat is in the artist's head is like, hey, this thing isn't ready to be released yet. I don't think it's good. I don't think it's great. I don't think people will like it. Whatever, right? Right, right, right. But then from the consumer side, how many times have we seen artists be wrong, right? You put something out that you didn't think was, was that good and the audience loves it. And because of that, you got great things because of it. And how many times have we seen the inverse, right? Yes. Have we seen somebody take forever That's to fair. work on the thing? Just to put it out and everybody's like, hey, I hate this. I wish you you, you never done this. And then you realize, dang, I wasted five, six months perfecting this thing that people don't even like. So what I've come to believe in from either side, you actually kind of put me onto this a, a couple of years ago, but you know, we always tell artists to kind of take like the fail fast, almost like tech approach to it, right? Mm-hmm. Put out as much, um, you know, quality in your perspective, things out as much as you can so you can gauge the marketplace. So you can then make those changes over time that will lead you to perfecting whatever the thing is that you're putting out. Like, I believe in that. So in that context, like if you're an artist that's trying to like figure that out, I do think not releasing music is stupid. If you're an artist that has a lot of those things figured out and like there's some creative strategy behind not releasing a lot, you know, you've built yourself to the point to where you can do a bit different of a release model. I could kind of understand, you know, in those instances, why not? But yeah. for like the average artist, then like, yeah, I, I have to agree. You know what? So there's some sentiment shared in the comments of this thread Mm. that I want to share before I give my perspective on it. So let's see a couple of things that people were saying. You see that it's on you if you, what does that say? If you choose one or the other. Yeah, one or the other. In my opinion, both are required if you want to stand out. Quantity and quality are required if you want to stand out. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Right, you can't just have a bunch of bullshit put out and expect people to yeah, like it. So like we it. know at some point you have to get the quality. Yeah. There has to be some quality in, in this thing. So we can't ignore that, right? But people use that as a crutch. So even if you have to take a few months break, a few months break to create music, content, and plan, you can put out music and content, hmm, support your your music consistently at a high quality. Okay, so he's basically saying right, stack up for the stack up the push. and then drop. Yeah. Okay, I like that perspective, that thought, right? Because even Russ, I believe, he said that when he did his whole high quality thing, he stacked up. Yeah, hella right? music, right? Release hella music, yeah. and then you keep recording through the process. So yeah. it's not like you're creating a new song a week that's going to come out the next week. Yeah, which I think is well, a lot of people got that confused. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of people got that strategy confused with that, and like it, it makes sense, right? Because as artists. More than likely, they're making dozens of songs a month. You know, like most of my artist friends, I have make a lot of music a month, right? right? To only have to put out one the next month, you know what I'm saying? So you realistically have like years of music stacked up that could keep you on. So that's another reason why I believe in it. It's like, bro, like put it out, you know what I'm saying? There's two other good perspectives I see here. So this other person said, the more beats you make, the better you get, the Mm -hmm. faster you become, the more you release quality. So he's also talking to the producer, the more your opportunity to create for yourself. So 
I think there's something that I know a lot of artists face when you haven't released something, you start to think about that thing yeah. and keep putting that energy into that thing because it's not out yet. So yeah. let me do one last edit, another edit. So it's hard to create space for new creativity if you haven't put it out, which I think is a good argument for putting certain things out and just getting it off your plate. So you have a new creative blank slate to work from. And then you have the idea of reps. The more times that you do it, the better you get. You should get, right? Yeah. Now, hard part is seeing yourself at start at zero because it's really vulnerable place to be at. But that's just ego, and your ego is what's actually keeping you from reaching your goals. F ego, release your shit, says Fred Pacey Music. And then there's one other one that said, I think he said somebody's getting mixed up. Let me see. Okay, there we go. Sir Poseidon said, people get this misconception of quality. Quality doesn't mean to work on 10 songs a year or just put out 10 songs a year. Quality means pick the best that you have. Mm. But to be honest, even that concept is not real because you never know what can take off. Mm -hmm. So he's acknowledging some difficulty with even that. As an artist, if you're not recording at least one song a week, you slacking. That's 52 songs at the end of the year. Okay. Now, the specifics of what an artist should be doing in terms of slacking or not, I you know, that's that's beyond me it's artist know, world yeah artist world y'all y'all <laughs> talk about that right but one thing that i've noticed is this idea of perfection is something that a lot of artists and people in general use to hide insecurity yeah right because if you don't think it looks good then there's something insecure about your work that you're trying to resolve you aren't confident in that work yet yeah all right so if i'm not confident in this work i'm going to keep changing it. i'm gonna keep changing it and if i'm afraid of what people's judgment is going to be when I get it out there, then again, I'm also insecure because I'm afraid of what that feedback might look like. People not liking it, people saying, why don't you change this or it should have been this or I like the last song better, whatever the feedback might be. But it's hiding this insecurity with your lack of confidence in either the work itself or just the insecurity beyond even the music of having that stuff out there being in that vulnerable state. So people say, I'm a perfectionist because how many people have you heard say I'm a perfectionist? In my life, probably ten. Are you are you being sarcastic? Bro? No, I'm dead ass. You, how long you been talking to these artists, bro? Like, oh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> like, probably a couple hundred. Yeah. Okay, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Like, like what well, I would say, ones I heard say, and I, I believe them. That's that's yeah. the point. Yeah, that's the point. <laughs> a lot of people say I'm a perfectionist. There's very few people that are a yeah. perfectionist. Yeah, and people don't understand perfectionism can be a crutch. Yeah. So there's specific roles. Like even if you look at a company and to build something well, you might want somebody who's a perfectionist in a specific role. If you look at a content system like a newspaper, right? Or yeah, let's just stick with a newspaper. You have your chief editor, right? Yeah. Who might be looking through all of your shit and they're noticing all the grammatical errors. They're noticing these things that don't, attach well or you missed a complete word in a sentence you want that person to have that oversight yeah and you leverage that perfectionism at scale but all the writers on the ground they you want them to not be incompetent right and just throw some sloppy shit and waste the editor's time right but they're not don't they don't necessarily have to be as much of a perfectionist as that chief editor right yeah. and then that chief editor isn't going to be the person who's marketing, branding, putting all the content out there, making sure the rest of the newspaper runs like it in these run. Yeah. That's a specific role. So there's roles for the skill set of, of editing or perfectionism. It could be utilized, but outside of the space that it best works, you're literally holding up the system. Yeah. Yeah. That's what people miss. And I, a lot of people say that shit as like one of those like, oh, what's one of your weaknesses? Uh, <laughs> when they're in a job interview. I'm a and like, yeah, I'm a perfectionist. You know, I just like things to be well. And I'm just always so, like, oh, that ain't no real weakness. That's what you're trying to flip it into. Yeah. No, bro. You're just slow. What's your real weakness? You're slow. <laughs> you're just slow, right? bro. You, you're not confident. You're not able to move <laughs> forward. And you get caught up on things to the point they have a diminishing return. Putting a, like, a dot over that eye out of a paper that has... 20,000 words mm -hmm. versus putting it out now, 
has a very, very low, <laughs> you know, yeah. benefit. Yeah. So that's the type of thing that I think people, artists need to get away from that idea of imperfection because one, like many people acknowledge, we don't even know what someone's going to love and what somebody's going to take to, Two, a lot of times the imperfection is what makes it relatable or hit the best. Yes, bro. You know what I mean? Yes. yes. And then three, a lot of times it's insecurity. And if you can acknowledge it for what it actually is, then you can start to move through it. But this whole idea of perfectionism, there's, it's hard to flip that and truly see it as a, a, um, a crutch when we use that term. There's a, such a positive stigma to it. Yeah. So if you keep telling yourself that, you're just going to be comfortable in that space and you need to be uncomfortable. You need to say, hey, look, man, you're being slow. You're not getting stuff out. Right. And how can I do this with a certain level of quality in a certain time span so I can make progress? Because nobody like who's doing stuff on a high level has the time to do every single thing to the extent that they want it to be out. Yeah, because to a couple of your points, one, fans start to feel it. It goes back to that conversation we had about Sam Smith, right? Fans start to be like, damn, like, he ain't put no music out in a while. Like, what's mm. what's going on that side, right? It's been a minute. Two, Law of Dimension returns. You know, it's, you, you have to think about if this thing is already a 95, what extra value does getting it to 100% get me, right? What's the value? You know what I'm saying? Like, does, is that 5% going to make a significant impact? If so, yeah, if that 5% makes, like, minor, like, you know, um, quality of life changes or something, then like more than likely it's not worth it, right? And then just last thing I want to touch on, because I think, you know, this is great, is that the relatability of sometimes letting the imperfection be in the music, right? And I was thinking about this as you said it, bro. Like Lil Wayne's lighter flick at the beginning of his music mm. in, in the mixtape days, I'm a thousand percent sure the first time that happened, it was a happy accident, right? I feel like he was in the, <laughs> in the booth sparking up the blunt. It's probably about to wipe it. And it was like, no, 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 wait, like leave yeah, that. You know what I'm saying? That, that was kind of cool. That. You know what I'm saying? That was yeah. kind of fire. And brand, look at what that shit did for him, like brand wise. Like I'm a thousand percent sure that was not on purpose. You know what I'm saying? Like, I wouldn't be surprised. That's a, that's a major example, but. Oh, you know another good example? What's up? What's the song? Is it Mo Bamba? About Shake West? Yeah. Like, oh. That shit, bitch. That was, um, he really fucked up. Yeah. What was I forgot that part of the song how it goes. It's the other one he had. Uh Lil like, Shake West, Dot Shake West, something like that. One of the shit one. that goes like fuck. Shit. shit yeah. Because like apparently like the beat yeah, stopped coming saying. through his ear or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Man, kept it in. It made the whole song. Yeah, and there's a lot of songs out there that are like that, bro. Like y'all would be surprised. Like if y'all could get some of the stories behind some of your favorite artist songs, you'd be surprised at how many of these things are like happy accidents. Let me take a quick second to say, if you're an artist trying to blow your music up, or if you're a manager, a music professional in general, trying to help an artist blow their music up, I have something that's a game changer for you, and it's completely free. As you may know, we've helped multiple artists go from zero to hundreds of thousands of streams. We've helped multiple artists go from hundreds of thousands to millions of streams, chart on Billboard, go viral, all of that stuff. And we've now made the way we've branded multiple artists and helped them go viral completely free, step by step in Brandman Network. All you have to do is check out brandmannetwork.com. You apply, it's completely free, but the thing is, we're not going to let everybody in forever. So the faster you apply, the better your chance of getting accepted. Brandmannetwork.com. Check it out. Back to the video. With that being said, the next topic, Twitter is trying to become YouTube. Mm -hmm. It's an argument that people are making. And I think it's very interesting. But Twitter is trying to become YouTube. And how is that happening? Twitter is now offering monetization for creators okay about time you can get paid to tweet okay now look tweets are far less work uh, oh yeah depending on who you ask yeah. that's true yeah <laughs> that's 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 true but i could imagine there's probably somebody who could go crazy in this new system which will break down just by tweeting they they tweet so easily and flow so smooth with it yeah imagine being able to tweet and create arguments because me, to me, this is going to create uh, an environment where it makes even more sense to do polarizing troll type posts. Because mm -hmm. all I got to do is tweet something out, get one community mad at me. All of a sudden, monetizing the hate, monetizing the hate, <laughs> baby. Let's go. So let's get a little specific with some of the details that Elon Musk, Twitter 
will share ad revenue for creators that appear in the reply threads, ads that appear in the reply threads, all right? Which is interesting. That is specific to you. So on the regular feed, no, but in my specific reply thread, yes. To be eligible though, the account must be a subscriber of Twitter Blue Verified. Mm. And got a caveat. That little caveat. I don't know how I feel about that caveat, All given right. the fact that all right, eight dollars a month, I gotta pay ninety six dollars a year. So I'm already in the negative. No right. other platform are they charging you to then make money back through ads. That's, that's true, but I mean, but they also have much harder criteria to get the monetization. YouTube's monetization criteria is pretty crazy. Instagram's monetization criteria aren't even like super clear. They just kind of like give it to you one I don't day. Count Instagram to be honest. You know what I'm so it's like <laughs> I look at that that eight dollars a month, like the parking pass you got to pay for at your nine to five. You know what I'm saying? It's no different than that. You got to you got to park at the job to get That's to the fair. job to make money. You know? That's fair. So That's fair. Okay. So. Then it comes down to how much money is going to be made yeah. through monetization. That's what's really going to right. Be, yeah. We don't know for sure yet. They haven't stated. It might be out by the time we post this, but that's going to be meaningful because it is really hard to make ninety six dollars a year. It's not something that you should look at for that. But we already know that you shouldn't just be looking at the content you create and monetization through YouTube ads, mm -hmm. TikTok any of these creator programs to be your primary income anyway. Yeah. All right. But back to Twitter becoming YouTube, competing with YouTube. Obviously, YouTube has been number one by far in terms of helping creators monetize. Yeah. We always say YouTube wealth is is different wealth than them other platforms. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Facts. yeah. You went in on there, <laughs> the numbers look crazy. It's getting worse per se, because of YouTube making the changes with shorts and now you make less money um, from long form content, all that stuff, right? Fair enough. But the fact that the when you got a million subscribers on YouTube, that's a real a million subscribers versus TikTok, Instagram, mm -hmm. you're still trying to figure out how to make money. Yeah. But just, we got people on YouTube, plenty of them just living off of platform ad revenue, just. Yeah. All right, so that's a different type of money. And I think that pressure is something that every platform is continuously feeling from YouTube. So eventually we get to this point. Yeah. TikTok creator fund, Instagram creator fund, and uh um, Snapchat got one. Snapchat, yeah, Twitter. Cause they're like, if we're gonna compete and gonna incentivize people, it can't just be views because people still gotta live. It has to be the money. Yeah. All right. Like Deion Sanders said, it must be the money. Now with that being said, this is why creators as a whole do better than artists. Because there's more people that are creators than artists. Artists is just a subset. Yeah. Right? So we keep seeing innovations in this conversation of pu pushing how much creators make forward. Like that conversation stays out there. We keep seeing this evolution on the platforms. And artists benefit from it too because they are content creators. Mm -hmm. But just being artist, that doesn't affect most of the population. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's a very specific um, niche that has that traditionally more just a record label relationship. And now it's evolved where more people are aware of what's going on inside the artist side of things. But this creator thing, it affects everybody. Everybody's seeing the numbers. They're trying to achieve that themselves. So that pressure is always going to keep them ahead of the game. And artists aren't going to necessarily see uh, as much progress as quickly. That just kind of is what it is. Yeah, except for the ones that, you know, like we've always said, kind of at least implement elements of the creator journey into what they're kind of doing. Because right. like I said, like there are a lot of artists who walk that line really well. And I think that most new artists need to learn how to walk that line because mm -hmm. what you are realistically seeing is that, hey, you could possibly make money from your Twitter, your YouTube, your Instagram, your TikTok before you start making money off of your music endeavors, right? Yep. So you're making money while you grow, making money to do the, these things that you have to do anyway. What I think is interesting about this is, I don't know if you remember, but it was a conversation we had in like an early episode about, it seems like these platforms are taking, making platform stars a lot more seriously, right? So we talked about how TikTok seems like it's doing certain things to boost up their creators. So, you know, TikTok, I guess, star can look just as popping 
um, just as you know, mainstream. This is your well top story. Like You're YouTube starting star today. Like mm -hmm. So now that makes me think about all the platforms where you don't even think about traditional stars coming from those platforms, right? Like a Twitter, a Facebook. Like I can't think of a, a Twitter influencer, right? Like someone who like popped just because of Twitter. Mm -hmm. like, I can't think of. I, I'm sure I'm wrong. I'm sure somebody's out there, but I can't think of one person. Yeah, like it's politics mm -hmm. that's probably the niche you see most mm -hmm. leaning on Twitter. politics mm -hmm. maybe news you know what i'm saying intellectual yeah. types you yeah. know what i'm saying but like there isn't like a the same way i could think of a guy girl that's like a TikTok influencer that that popped because of the TikTok medium i can think of the same thing with instagram like think same thing with youtube i cannot think of one with, yeah. with twitter yeah. um so to me it feels like this is their effort to change that you know oh, it's kind of like the streaming platforms like every streaming platform wants their X platform original, right? Everybody they want their Netflix original or their Hulu original or their Amazon. It's like yeah. I look at influencers like that. This Charlie D'Amelio is a TikTok original. You know what I'm saying? The same way that I don't know, Zeus is a YouTube original. The same way you can maybe mm -hmm. say like an Aiden Ross is a Twitch original, right, right? right? Like I think these platforms are seeing, hey, we have to incentivize more of these creators to want to be our platform stars, you know what I'm saying? So that the 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 goodwill of the brand can spread and more creators will kind of want to come work over here. So, um, so I mean, I think it's a good step forward for Twitter. One that if you had asked me, wasn't that necessary? Because I don't think I've ever heard the argument about getting tweets monetized. I, I feel like I've never heard anyone complain never. about that. So it feels like they've worked themselves into a, a this is, an interesting hole. This is that meme <laughs> where it says no one. Yeah. <laughs> Twitter <laughs> drops monetization for content creators. Yeah. So it's like, now you got to join the battle of paying people and what comes with that. And nobody was yeah. really looking for that for Twitter. But yeah. I'm interested to see how they handle it long term. You know what I'm saying? We will, we, we yeah. will we gonna, see. We're going to see. We will see. Now, in other news, NFTs for music are not dead yet. And... We can use Rihanna as proof of it, but okay. actually, technically, it's not Rihanna, and you'll see exactly what I mean by this story right here. So, fans, going to get my money. That's the headline, kind of corny, <laughs> but you know. Deputy drops royalty shares in Rihanna's bitch better have my money. Now, what exactly does this mean? I'll read through it, all right? So, the company, another block is reviving up to drop shares. No, it's revving up to drop shares and yet another iconic track. The royalty NFT platform is working with Maverick producer named Deputy to grant fans access to a portion of his streaming royalties from Rihanna's bitch better have my money. In his very first NFT project, starting at 5 p.m. tomorrow, just a few days before Rihanna's long-awaited Super Bowl halftime show, people will be able to buy it. Now, the purchase price was about like $210, if I remember correctly. I and like that, yeah. yeah, there we go. With the platform offering 300 NFTs at $200. So that's something to come back to a piece with each giving holders a portion of 0.0033% of streaming royalties. Bitch Better Have My Money is, of course, on one of Another Block's Biggest Drops. That's a weird name. Another Block's Biggest Drops, less than six months. So let me just summarize this because they got a lot of weird word in here. At the end of the day, this guy owns his portion of the song. He was the producer of the beat, right? The fact that he was able to give this very small portion, because I bet he still owns plenty of it, yep. right? But then create this branding idea around it. Use Rihanna's name, like you mentioned earlier but still provide value to the fans is something that shows why this is significant because if you matter to your fans something like this is still going to be meaningful like i would have bought this for myself and i probably would have got one for my girl just say hey yeah i know you love riri i got you a little ownership of her, her song you yeah know what I mean? you know how people buy stars and stuff like yeah. that and name it after <laughs> like i got you someone really yeah, a little investment a little investment girl a little <laughs> investment now <laughs> that being said, it would take about 15 years to make your money back with the estimates. The projection was like, I think, what was it? Was it 15? No. So you would make 6.5% each year on that investment based on current streaming projections. So that's around $13 per year. Take about 15 years to make that $210 back. So it's less of an investment, more of a sentiment. Yeah. Right? But that's 
what I think a lot of the conversation around NFTs will have to be in the future. It has to be more sentiment than investment. And most of the problem around the scam culture, et cetera, is getting people to see it as money. Like, oh yeah, this is going to be an investment. You get, uh, you buy this from me and then you're going to be able to sell it at that next value and everybody's coming in for that. And that's what creates the gold rush, mm -hmm. mess around and find some pyrite instead of gold, get rich, fast culture that ultimately ends up crashing. It ends up in a lot of unhappy broke folks. So switching, I like this, to this idea where they even map out clearly, hey, it's going to take 15 years to make your money back. That takes away that idea of someone thinking about it that way. Yeah. Right? It's like, hey, do you want this just to have a piece of this moment in time, one of her biggest tracks, maybe yeah. your favorite track from Rihanna or just, you know, a piece of your favorite artist, that type of conversation. I think we'll have lasting value in an in a NFT space. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Because that was always kind of the thing with me with the NFT space was everyone was, like you said, selling their NFT as like a gold rush. Like, hey, you know, hold on to it and then X amount of time, you'll make X return on it. But just because I bought a couple of NFTs and personally, my favorite NFTs are the ones that like, I don't really see any like value or like growth of value from. I just like them, right? And I view them almost as 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 like a collectible right no different than me buying some exclusive merch item from the artist or some t-shirt or like tour item or something so i look at nft like that and to your point like you said i think this will be what makes nfts even more approachable on like a consumer side because there's still like a lot of consumers for so all the artists that have been pushing it um and and still trying to push it they have to realize they're in the bubble and there's still a lot of general consumers who just are super skeptical of it. I know because yes. I was just I was talking to one yesterday. So it's this conversation. Really? Yeah. Fresh <laughs> in my head, bro. I got a yeah. got a got a got an art homie. Um I just hate the ideas of NFTs and what it's doing to the visual art community. It's a whole nother conversation. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying? But those people still exist. So it's gonna take things like this where it's like, hey, I do see the sentimental value in this to get me over that this is a scam hump so that I can then buy it to then see like, oh, this isn't that bad. You know what I'm saying? That goes back to Twitter, right? Because you mm -hmm. want to shine these success stories. Yeah. So the artist Three Loud dropped in 2021. He raised about $16 million, mm -hmm. right? From him, from this type of process. And he since paid out $132,000 to fans, you know? So that sounds good. Now, how many fans that's spread across? I don't know. But it sounds good to share those big numbers yeah. and it makes it sound attractive from all sides, right? The fan, the artist, et cetera. And when I say Twitter and bring that in and why they why they want to find that star, like what you said, mm. is because when you have that star to say, this represents us, this is us, it inspires other people to try, right? It's the marketing. Yeah. You, know, you want to call it the pyramid or something. Yeah. It is like, ah, yeah. if I can say you can be successful, it's America, the American dream. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody believes they can do it. And then at some point, you know, you have a lot of people who aren't doing it, but they're at least committed to the dream. Yeah. And they're right? still building the, the perception of it like it's, by even trying. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They're showing it can be done, which mm -hmm. means now that it's, it's not their fault or the system's fault. It must be your fault because some people are doing it. It's that entire scheme. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which. You know, look, I get it, right? So that's kind of what the NFT world did at scale, and it's still going to do that in some ways. But if people could focus a lot more on the value from a from just the like I said, sentiment, the value of the art itself, yeah, then I think people will be better. The art and the artist, because like you said. Maybe you literally just like this. Why the hell do you buy prints and you put on your wall? Because I, I fought with it. Yeah, you don't yeah. do that like a Picasso and say, oh, this is an investment. Most art that people buy is because they like it and they don't expect a return on it. But NFT brought that conversation in because, of course, you know, there's nothing that triggers people outside of like fear and violence. It like mm -hmm. the potential to make some money. Yeah. Right. So I, I get how it got to where it is. And I know that it was intentional. It was definitely intentional. But there is still going to be utility. Before we switch to this next topic, which is really, really good topic because artists, record labels, there's still a lot of struggle. And we're going to share a snippet of an artist basically straight up saying she got shelved, how and why it affected her career. Before we get to that, I want to get a little bit of a tidbit from you 
of that artist saying NFTs are messing up the visual artist community. I want I want to understand his argument. I mean, I don't completely understand the argument because let me let me think back to it. Pretty much, they felt like the NFT space in terms of art is controlled by like elitist artists, okay. right? Those artists who come from wealthier backgrounds for whatever reason have the money to invest in. The way, man, it sounds like the stuff you need to put out NFTs. Now, I don't know a lot about putting an NFT out. Um, I haven't been following the space super heavy, but I personally don't feel like the process is like super, super difficult from what I've seen on like OpenSea and a couple of different places that like have these templates and walkthroughs that break it down for you. So that argument was the the competition with elitists, you know, which mm -hmm. I think from a creation standpoint, they don't have a point. I think from a marketing, putting it out there, perspective that standpoint, the, most yes. of the NFTs that do do great. The, the people behind it back and they got money. You know, right. Man. It is like a circle jerk between yeah. a group of friends, essentially, in yeah. most cases. Yeah. And then other than that, like I said, I didn't really get the argument because the rest of the argument was like, oh, what's my still my work? Like, what's my still your work you make now? People still art now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that don't change nothing. Um, something along the lines of not respecting like traditional cultures. I was like, we had digital artists for at least tw two decades at this point, niggas still buying paintings and drawings and shit yeah. off the street. You know something? Like, that's not true. And what was the last thing? I think the last thing was just more about like spreading artists out across different mediums. Like he felt like, you know, the world is trying to force artists to learn these different mediums when they should, it's just crazy as I'm saying, it's out loud, it's a music artist argument. It's actually wild, bro. That's it just, what it I just was gonna me. say. It just clicked with me. But like, yeah, like they're like, it's forcing them to have to learn all these different mediums when they just want to be artists and create. I'm like, it's, it's always gonna be the world, you know what I'm saying? We've already talked about this. We've <laughs> already talked about this, and I'm glad. And I'll ask you this because I wanted artists to hear other artists, yeah, say, right, in yeah. other spaces <laughs> say that exact same thing. The arguments that they're making, everybody feels this way. Yeah. So it's not just y'all. Don't feel attacked because you can go in another space and you'll probably feel just the same, same or same somebody thing. is gonna feel the same about you going into their space. Everybody has a complaint. That's not something that can be focused on, but. I think the argument for the idea of elitists or these communities that are in the know is fair, but that also dissipates the rest of the argument because it's like, yo, well, if these people are focused here, that means most of the people that have to do with your audience probably aren't even in this space. Mm -hmm. So keep performing as normal. Yeah, that's you argument. Know what's that's forcing with. you to get on there right now. Yeah, to me, it came back more so to the argument of community because it's like, well, yeah, you're right. Like, you know, like I said, if you want to be doing tens of millions off your NFT, yeah, you're yeah. going, you, you, now you bumping shoulders with some people who got some serious money. You just want to sell 15 collectibles to your, your audience that likes your shit. Like, that's not going to affect anything you have going on. You know, like none of your audience can be like, oh, I sure wish I could get that collectible artwork, but I just dropped 25 bands on the NFT last night. Like, that's probably not your audience. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Saying those things and doing that thing. So yeah. there's still this growing group of people who you can capitalize off of. And some of them who you can only capitalize off of because they're only thinking about it because you're doing it. You know what I'm saying? Like, like that's what got me into NFTs. Were like, there were specific artists and not even just music artists, but like visual artists and music artists that I liked that I saw doing NFT projects that made me go like, okay, let me like figure this space out. Like my first NFT was a, um, print from this artist in Atlanta, uh, that's from Atlanta that I like, you know what I'm saying? I buy a lot of his stuff, so I w I'm not, you know what I'm saying? I wasn't out here dropping 50 bands on the NFT, but he got me, you know what I'm saying? He got me to spend like, I think I maybe bought his NFT for like $300 or something like that, you know what I'm saying? Um, so that was the argument that I made to the art homie, like, yo, if you've done all the things that we tell you to do, or you know, people like me tell you to do, and you've built a community, nothing you just said matters. And if you haven't done any of those things, then all of that stuff does matter, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you're right, like now, now you're trying to, it's the, to me, it's the same argument of like the underground artists wanting to compete with the major label artists, right? Like you're looking at all the resources they have access to, all the things they, they could possibly get done. And you're thinking like, oh, I can't do it unless I'm able to either do it at that level or be able to compete with somebody at that level. But right. to your argument, it's like, no, because they have this whole area up here captured and no one's focusing on all the people down here. That means that there's room for to make money off all the people down here. Cause all these people are looking up at this thing and that's making them want it even more. You know what I'm saying? So you even benefit, but they can't afford that thing, right? Like I said, all of us saw, was that the the eight NFT that was going crazy at some point? Everybody in the world saw that shit, bro. Like yeah. everybody saw that. Everybody, a lot of people didn't have money for that shit, but that made a lot of people interested in NFTs that would now go like, okay, cool, I'm not dropping a meal on a picture of a monkey. 
But I'll go give my favorite artist, Lou, who whatever, fifty dollars for this NFT or some exclusive cover art he put out, right? Or like I said, the artist I like, I'll go pay three hundred for this exclusive NFT print of some shit he's not making in real life, right? Same same shit, you know. Let me ask you this. Okay. There's a popular car that has stars okay. on top. You know what car I'm talking about? Yeah, I do know what car you're talking what's, about. What's it called? Is it, damn, they just put me on the spot, bro. The Rolls Royce? Is it the Rolls Royce? No, it's not a Rolls Royce. It's the, um, I don't know, man. I don't know the name. I just know it. <laughs> they don't put me on the spot, bro. <laughs> they don't blew my whole spot up, bro. They gonna, they gonna, what do you mean? Yeah, I can like, never claim to be a car and through. I can never flip that brand <laughs> and even try to play it off like that. You, you, you are here. <laughs> I'm going to put them on the screen. All right. No car sponsorships for me. I, I, <laughs> no car brand deals. <laughs> oh man, Come on, it's, the, it's the most popular rap car there is. I, that's what I'm saying. As soon as you said, it, I'm like, oh, duh. But I cannot think. You got of some of it right. It's just that you just didn't say. You said the brand. You didn't say the name. All right, this is where your confusion came in. So it's, it's not just the, the Rolls. Uh, it's all the Rolls Royce. It's actually multiple. Okay. Right? So the Phantom, okay. the Wraith, and the Ghost, which. The Ghost, I actually personally, well, I'm not the biggest car. Like when it comes to Rolls Royces, I actually don't like none of them. So, but I, so I never quite understood what the Ghost, like what made that one so special. But anyway, the whole point of it, right? So, what's that car called? Many people know it, but it's the Rolls Rolls Royce brand. People see this car. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen a Chrysler 300? Mm -hmm. you use that same model, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. Now. You familiar with Gucci? You familiar with Louis? There's levels above that for those who don't know. Mm -hmm. But then there's also Coach. There's also Guess. Mm -hmm. There's all these other brands. That ladder exists for a reason. Yeah. Right. And that's the point you're making. I can't afford this NFT art at this level, but I still want to have an NFT. So let me go find something that can allow me to still feel like I'm in the game. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna pay. 50 for this one, 100 for this one, 1,000, whatever I can afford. I can't pay 100K, but I could pay 5K. I could pay 500. I could pay $5. Cool. So that's the whole argument for growing market share. That's yep. really what that's called in business. Like, typically, if somebody's number one and they're extremely dominant in the market, they're not always looking to monopolize and get rid of all competitors. To some extent, you begin to want competitors because they help grow the market share. Mm -hmm. So you stop trying to grow your company. You just try to grow the market because as the market gets bigger, it creates more space for you. Right. And more customers that allow for more growth. It's just like being Spotify. But you're where you are right now. And nobody's close yet. What's the gap? A lot of people still aren't actually streaming mm -hmm. music. Yeah, maybe 33% of the American population that's streaming music at this moment in terms of like being a part of a DSP and all, and all that. So with that being said, because I remember it was only like four months ago, I asked my dad um, about something on Spotify. He didn't know what Spotify was. And I just said it matter of factly. And then I had to educate him on Spotify. <laughs> it threw the whole conversation off. I'm like, I thought everybody knew what Spotify. I'm, you know, this, this is 2022. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it just started to click. And then you start looking at statistics still everybody's not like most of the world um is not on streaming platforms like yeah. that right yeah so you want because it's a, it's a completely different behavior you're still competing with old ways of consuming music so you want to grow the idea of consuming music through that specific mechanism because the more people get used to that now they're in the game and now i can say hey i'm better than them yeah but if they're just against the idea all together then I can't do shit about it. That's a tall ladder to climb and it gets really expensive. Yeah. So you start to want competitors, but that same idea is why what you said, right? When there's somebody at the top, right? Yes, the, there are these elitists and other people that you're com uh, competing with, but there's still going to be an entire marketplace that doesn't like the art, doesn't connect whatever, whatever culture subsect mm -hmm. that is, can't afford whatever they're offering. Yeah. And that's where you come in. He's like, hey, yeah. I'm better than X, Y, and Z because of this. Or I know you're missing this. It's just, it becomes marketing messaging, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah, NFTs, like, you know, they they got, uh, I don't wanna use that word, but they, they got exploited 
And we already knew that was going to come, the period of time where people had to take a step back. Mm -hmm. But slowly but surely, the value is still going to come back and people need to put it in the right frame of reference. So uh, it's, it's not going to be the the thing that people thought it was. I don't even want to get into speculating what it's going to be because I want to get to this next topic that's even more important because there's an artist that left the biggest record label in the world. Why did she do this? Why did she force her way out? Well, I'm going to go ahead and play this clip so she can speak for herself. I signed to the biggest record company in the world. It still is. It's Universal Republic. And I just got lost in the shuffle. You know, they had Post Malone, Drake, Taylor Swift, Nicki Minaj. And I wasn't on that level. So they were just like, OK, we're going to shelve you until something miraculous happens. But it was so incredibly difficult to not be able to release any music and still just be like spinning my wheel. So I ended up asking them to let me go and they graciously did because by that point I was about 2.5 million dollars in debt and they did not have to let me go they could have kept me there and held me there but luckily they did let me go and then I started building out an independent career and licensing my songs in different territories and really seeing more connection and success that way so if you are an artist, a new artist, I really strongly encourage you to build everything you can on your own until you just need them to like, you know, put you on SNL or something. Because if you expect a record company to take you from zero to 10 or even five to 10, um, you're, you're really putting all of your control into their hands. Also, I just want to stress that you don't need to be at 10. Like you can have a very fine career at a five or a four or a six. And Julius, she preaching, man. She, she's saying a lot of stuff and it's yeah. coming from real experience, like two, $2.5 million in debt experience. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it's a lot of wisdom. <laughs> a lot of wisdom, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the biggest problems that I see artists do, though. Not, I'm not even saying her, but it just reminded me that artists get so caught up in going to majors and going to teams that have all these dope artists there. Mm -hmm. When you don't realize if you're not on those artists level, the incentive to work on you and for you is not necessarily there. Yeah, well, those are our roadblock. You got to. Bow that room and yeah. artists. If y'all don't know artists, if y'all haven't looked in the mirror, artists are selfish. They're like, yo, what you doing doing all that work for him? Why is he on that playlist mm -hmm. and I'm not on that playlist? Mm -hmm. They start looking at other people on the label trying to figure out that y'all making moves, y'all making progress, but you still haven't responded to me or or my project or my single just didn't it didn't hit the way it needed to. Yeah. Like all this is happening. So if you're feeling that way and you might go through something like that. Imagine an artist that has 10 times more leverage doing that. And then there's multiple of those artists that are doing that. But, hey, I'm in this system and they got all these people on the team. So they should be able to get a feature from me with these different types of artists or they should be able to help me with all these moves. If the incentive isn't there, a lot of times you're better off going with a team where you are their primary priority. Yeah, that's where the indie labels and stuff start and, shining. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's where any label start to shine because you being their priority is what's going to help you in your career. Yeah. And I know it looks tough. Oh, you got to build something up versus I could join something. They have all these different resources. But what's the, the outcome at the end of the day? Even if you if you hit and you see some progress, if you're not the main priority and they want you to be the biggest thing possible because it's also incentivized for them to make you the biggest thing possible, why wouldn't I just be happy with just taking you to level six? Because I already got some tens and the work I would have to do, taking my attention off the ball, it's easier to keep this 10 at 10 than it is to go take you from six to 10. Yeah, but I exactly. like you being at a six. Yeah. You know what I mean? Six makes me money. Yeah, six makes me money. Yeah. We're in the space. I'm good with that, but you aren't good with that because you want to be a 10. Yeah. So it's really about finding a team that has the abilities but are not in a place where they have that much going on for whatever reason. And that looks different. There could be, there's like these execs that leave a label and they're now they're just starting. So they've mm -hmm. done this before plenty of times and they have all kinds of relationships and they're in some kind of partnership mm -hmm. and they do this, but because of where they are, they're focusing on somebody new and you could be that first like project for them, mm -hmm. right? It's like early on when Jay-Z, who came president of Def Jam 
the Rihanna yeah. was a really, really big deal for him. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not that um obviously Rihanna wasn't Rihanna and who she became anyway. She she didn't have that in her, but it was really priority in comparison to what that would look like after having a Rihanna and those things and Jay-Z not being a new person, right? Yeah. Again, him yeah. being new, I'm trying to prove myself. I'm starting up this new company looks way different. So if y'all can find teams and people like that in the industry, that's something to look out for. I'm not saying never do any of these companies that have somebody on their team because maybe they're just one person or two or maybe even two artists and then you can fit in some other way somehow, right? But especially if your demographics overlap, right? Yeah. Yeah. Competition for resources. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. competition for resources. Yeah. There's all these different things where people like to look at people winning. That's the biggest thing. People, everybody wants to be on a winning team, but don't understand what being on a winning team looks like. It means you're going to be third string. Third string, baby. Because <laughs> they already got a packed roster. Yeah. You go to Golden State Warriors and you're going to have to give up something. All right, you you might not have the ball in your hand as much because they got Steph Curry, Draymond Green, Klay Thompson. They had KD for a period. So like you know, you go to a team yeah. like that. I got the ball less in my hands, and I'm I might win more, but the difference is in the art side that doesn't mean you win more. Yeah, on the sports side, <laughs> that means yeah, I got a ring, and I probably did less work to get it. On the art side, that just means I didn't get a ring. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so that's the problem you can't take that mentality everywhere per se you want competent people you want good people people who did shit but going to a pack roster is overrated yeah and I, I think the other big thing she touched on too which was I know was a, a huge eye opening experience for me when we learned it was that these smaller artists that are signed to major labels have to do the same amount of work that artists who aren't signed to major yep. labels are right so I know I personally learned that lesson in like 2019. I think 2019 was when I first ever got um, a major label client, and we had a we had a good amount that year, right? And I remember us working with this one like smaller I don't want to say the label, but one smaller major label act. And I just remember like being on the calls every week, like listening to their marketing manager, and you know having the budget conversation. It's like man, like you artists that signed to this major entity you look no different than this 3 p.m call i have with this artist from back fucking nowhere with yep. you know what i'm saying x exactly. amount of dollars in his bank account and so what that taught me was that for newer artists well well for established artists or artists that maybe have some momentum already what the label does for you and, and what that building looks like for you is much different than the artist that has is new that just signed to that label mm. when you are new and you just signed to a label you the only difference between you and an unsigned small act is that if something magical were to happen for you, there's a building of people that can help you take advantage of it versus the small artist. Let's say, let's say both artists got a viral moment. Artists at the major label, label going to ideally kick into motion, start putting things together, right? Right. Artists without a label, he or she has to start figuring shit out, right? Well, what do I do? What do I do next? But until that happens, everything else about the process is exactly the same. That, look, man, if I'm a label, like if my label, my record label can talk. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the record label would say, "We don't make magic. We channel it." Yeah, that's fair. You make the magic. Yeah. We just yeah help that magic go into places, channel it into new places because one, you're the artist, you're the product, right? Mm -hmm. And two, no one ever believes me when I say this because I always see comments, labels cannot create momentum yeah we cannot create momentum this is me still speaking as a label all right we can't create the magic however we know what to do with the magic yeah all right we know how to make that shit go to another level another level keywords yeah. another level yeah. we gotta get on a level though <laughs> yeah. like we can't take it to its first few levels and the moment artists get that and it starts to make sense especially when you look at things today. There was a time, I think some of that's the, the dissonance, where a label did control so much part of the process and they even were more a part of making the magic, right? Or at least creating the infrastructure for that magic to be made. But now we're in today. And that that problem is, like you people, we say that, and I think every time we say that, people hear like, oh, labels don't do nothing or labels don't do nothing for you. 
in a completely bad way. But when you look at some of these agreements, it just makes sense as well. Yeah. All right. Like that's your partner. A problem only comes when you expect me to do that and I don't do it. Yeah. But my assumption is you understand what this actually is. That's that's the problem. It seems like with a lot of these labels, because they're like, well, this is what we do. Yeah. Right. And this yeah. is what we always do across all these situations. I didn't tell you I was going to do that. I think that gap, though, is the reality is, no, that is what labels do. That's how they're supposed to function in today's age. However, there are people that are selling the dream so hard, they don't make it clear that that's not what they do. That's a part of it. Yeah, and I think some of it too is just like like uh, adaption, right? Like if I'm a label, okay, and I don't know, let's think of the artists of yesteryear, right? 1950s, some some smooth singing young buck that I found on the, the streets of Mississippi or some shit. Right. This motherfucker probably don't know nothing about music, more than likely, not had any serious form of training. So I think at that time development was priority because like we had to walk this person through the route or they just wouldn't be able to do it. You fast forward to to, to, to today, not only are there, is there information and resources on the internet that artists can take advantage of, there are also different entities in between ground zero and major label that will also help you figure all this stuff out. So I'm looking at like, if I'm a label and I know that it's possible that by the time someone gets to me to where it makes sense, I don't even have to do anything. And I know that because I've seen it. I've signed artists that already came in with a content team and had a booking agent and had toured, you know what I'm saying, 20 different cities. Um, You know what I'm saying? I already had artists come in that already had a million subscribers on, uh, followers on TikTok, half a million subscribers was generating 50K a month. If I now I'm a label saying like, oh shit, we don't even have to develop people one-on-one anymore because if we just cast the net wide enough we'll collect all the people that figured it out before they got to us and now we can just focus on like she even said it putting you in places you can't get to i can get you on jimmy Kimmel. i can get you on this Mm -hmm. this thing this thing that like you need crazy resources to get access to right i would have did the exact same thing you know what i'm saying and i I know like labels still sign artists um that aren't popping like they still sign artists who who are at zero like i said we've worked with some of them but i think that is Kind of like you said, one to just still kind of sell the dream. Like we still do that, right? Like, hey, we're gonna pick you up obscure mm-hmm. artists and help you go from, you know what I'm saying, zero to ten. And then, you know, most labels even still are worked on by people who are passionate about music. But people who are passionate about music are gonna find people they like and believe in for whatever reason and finesse them into the system, right? This this leads to the other conversation, the Ray conversation. Oh right? uh, yeah, yeah. So for those of y'all who don't know, she's an artist in the UK. Yeah. And my first my first encounter with her was back in, I don't know, like 2017, because I would use all these song snippets as a part of my promo. And she was one of the artists I found. I was like heavy A&R all back then, because a lot of people that I shared early on became big, man. So they got <laughs> they got the, the approval from, from Adventure ATL and Sean early on, man. Um, now, with that being said, though, like I didn't hear from her after that. I was like, oh, yeah, she's going to be it. I saw it and I didn't hear from her. And then as of recent, we were just in our meeting and this information comes out about like her label kind of holding her back. Mm -hmm. And you said you had been seeing some of that conversation too, right? Yeah, like over the last like three, four days. I'm going to let you like go deeper into it because I didn't realize any of it. Y'all were telling me about how well, no, no, her back. no, I was saying I had never heard of her as much as I heard of her until the last. Uh, okay, I thought she okay. was like, I thought she was a completely new act. Okay. I saw a little bit of that narrative, but I thought she was completely new. And then, you know, like Sam dropped in our group chat and I went and looked up and I was like, oh, she got like 20 million monthly listeners. Who oh, I didn't even see that one when yeah. you dropped that. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. here's basically the, the breakdown. Her label wouldn't let her drop music. Yeah, pretty much. Period. Right. She was signed um, to... Polydor back in 2021. No, she took on her record label Polydor back in 2021 to basically say, hey, y'all got to let me out of this thing. And she won. She had more than 17 million monthly listeners on Spotify. Now she's at like 30 something monthly yeah, listeners. Yeah, like 20 something, 30, yeah, somewhere in there. She's popping, right? And she even has top 20 hits to her name. Like she got seven of them with like Beyonce. John Legend in terms of like songwriting skills. Okay. So, so okay. yeah. So she got some skills out there. And in the end of it though, she took to Twitter and used Twitter as leverage to say, hey, I need to get out of this agreement. 
And that's what multiple artists have done. But as you said, some artists are doing that and not coming out. Not coming out. They're not coming out of that situation, <laughs> right? Which is a whole other conversation. But she went out on Twitter to vent about being trapped in this deal with songs not being able to be released or simply being passed on to other artists because her pen game was so strong. So they were taking her music, shit that she wrote for herself and passing it on. I don't know how that happens. That's one thing that I personally haven't known of an artist going through where they're writing stuff and your record label has the right to say, no, we're going to give it to somebody else. I personally, you know, I'm, I'm hearing a new different finessing scenario every day of music. It's, it's, it's crazy, yeah. but that's, that, that sucks. <laughs> I, I can imagine it's like that. You wrote this shit for yourself. And then they have the right to say who it goes to or not. So, they just they, hit you like, thanks for that Beyonce hit. You're like, what? Right, exactly. Because <laughs> they'll pass it on, but then tell her it's not good enough to be on her album. Yeah. All right. So, but we're going to still cap in another way. Yeah. So, in mid July, she got released from her, her, her contract. And there's been so many artists that have been sidelined for periods of time, which we can get into for another conversation. But what happened with her, which is what made me think about her when you said the statement of the industry still has people at these companies who are all for the art so you might get this artist signed early mm -hmm. her situation was the person that signed her or was her primary advocate end up moving on from the company oh that happens so yeah, much yeah and she's locked down yeah in this scenario and your main hero your main um you know supporter is no longer there to support you and it happens so much, right? The company gets reshuffled, reorged, or somebody gets another opportunity. Mm. And then next thing you know, these other people don't even believe in you. They don't see the vision like you. Yeah, they and, didn't believe in you like Steve believed in you. Right, exactly. <laughs> and it's one thing to be a Two-Face company and we just pushing this line of Two-Face. So it's like, oh, the new person that comes in, they know that they're pushing this line of Two-Face. But this yeah. is art, it's more particular. Yeah. Like you even have people at more traditional companies like that say, ah, well, I don't get credit for pushing this Two-Face. I want to come up with a whole nother one just so I can get credit. So you already have that type of ego that might come into it. But then yeah. literally we're talking about art. So it's specific. Even if that person was a nice person and was trying to like help deliver on some of the things the label had for you, they might not see the vision or understand the vision. And that's the thing that sucks about being at these companies when people move on and that's something that can happen at you name it any label any of these any of these, these, companies. these organizations yeah. and that's when it comes down to the reality of it these companies the industry as a whole is made of people it's all people right so we'll say labels this label that the music industry this music industry that but it's people so she had a person that would have done right by her. Apparently, mm -hmm. I've seen this at many labels. I remember when uh, I think I, I think L.A. Reid left some one which whichever label he left, and a lot of artists on the label were like, "Oh shit, man, yeah, you gotta go." Yeah, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta go. I gotta figure out how to get out of here since he's leaving. Yeah, right. Right. So you have that advocate, you have that person on your team, and a lot of the times it's really about finding the people. And connecting with those people, getting deals and relationships with those people, not necessarily pursuing a label in itself. All right. Because it might look like, oh, they're in a good position to handle every single part of my process because of their resources. But do you connect with those people? Do those people see your vision? Are they incentivized? Because, again, you are still competing with other artists on the label and none of that leads back to the exact same business. Not your business. Right. Yeah. That artist doesn't increase your business. There's a lot of different factors to consider. But yeah, I, I, I find it so interesting when you hear about those, especially because it really sucks when you, it's like you did actually make the right decision. Yeah. The person just left though. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I just learned this last year actually that you can, um, you can negotiate in your contracts with certain entities that like if this person that brought you in leaves, then you can go or they can restructure your contract. I don't remember the exact name of you know the, the cause or the thing that lets you do that mm. i'm not a lawyer you know what i'm saying like but i i learned this a couple months ago um because like that happens but we're going through that right now with a, with tiktok bro like you know what i'm saying so we know oh the, my god we know right. the pain bro right, like bro. you know built up all this trust this relationship finally got a good flow going then if they email such and such has been let go hey. some new person taking up your account we've been through that 50 times with tiktok like 
not literally, no, I, not literally fifty, but we've been through it probably five times five in the last, in the seven. last like, year and a half. Yes, yeah, like changing new people, <laughs> changing new people. Every time you get cool with one person, and have a little flow going, literally it's somebody else, and it takes you three months to even have that first meeting with that new person, and then they're only going to be gone two and a half months from then, one hundred percent. And there's the other company. Not gonna put the company name out there, but you know we got our main advocate. Okay. And they're like, hey, yeah. hey, connect with somebody else before you leave the building. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, which they are about to do? So shout out them. They yeah. shout out to them. Shout out, them. Shout out to them. Yeah. <laughs> right, but that that's literally a part of it. So, the that's why you see some people move and shake so much in music though, because like. Hey, bro, it's all a moving target. Let me just try to know everybody. Yeah, bro. You really <laughs> never know, bro. Like, nothing. You check in. Hey, bro, once again, congrats. Oh, I mean, I left that place like six months ago. What? 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 But, hey. yeah, music jobs have a crazy turnover rate. That's a conversation for another day. But the turnover rate in any music position is wild, bro. A lot of it. It's, it's like <laughs> sales. Yeah. That's the only one of the main places where I also see that type of, like, turnover. And it's not all looked at as negative yeah you just see people going from company to company to company especially like within tech like, oh yeah i was an sdr over here i was an sdr over here and just trying to find find a way but yeah now music look again always remember it's the people so all the people can't be bad but you just got to find those people instead of just looking for hey i want to be on this label who are the people who are over there Right. Or I want to be on this management team or I want to be a part of this artist collective, whatever it is. You can't just look at how the situation is going good. You got to look at how can it go for you? Yeah. Yeah. Facts. Right, period. Facts. Period. And look, can't just be from your perspective because, you know, you're having them rosy eyes like, oh, man, yeah, this just happened and that just happened and that. And they got this so they can do that for me. But did they say they were going to do that for you? Do they see that happening in that way? Yeah, is that shit in your contract? <laughs> is that in your Oh. Yes, I'm glad you said that because I thought about this when you talked about negotiating the person in the building being there or not. Yeah. Every single thing is negotiable in these contracts. Yeah, facts. Like it gets very, <laughs> very specific and what you negotiate just becomes better based on what you know. Yeah. Right? Because that might not matter for some artists for whatever reason, but people who get it and have been through that, they're going to like, oh, I'm going to neg negotiate that next time. But there's some artists who never end up hitting that particular issue in their career. Yeah. Right? But so it's not always about trying to get over on somebody or or not. It's literally just having the experience and being able to play chess to know that certain possibilities might happen and how do you guard yourself contractually if this thing happens. Because they might not know they're going through a reorg. The people you're talking to they might not know like, oh, shoot, bro. We, you know, we're damn near just in an uh, imprint. We don't really have control control. Mm -hmm. And now they said they don't like the way we performing. So and it's not necessarily on this department. It's the other side. So yeah. they just said they're going to put a new CEO in place. And that dude's going to get rid of all the people he don't know. And he going to. You know, yeah. bring over all his homies. All oh, the buyouts? The, the buyouts. The buyouts. There's, there's so many <laughs> factors where it's not straightforward. And it's just on you to observe, talk to people who know, to then begin to think about some of these things that will protect you even when you aren't necessarily being done wrong. You just find yourself in a uh, a uh, constantly changing environment. Yeah, That's man. the best way to say <laughs> A revolving door. <laughs> a revolving door for sure. <laughs> For sure. Now, with that being said, what is it really like for a songwriter in 2023? We talked about this in the St. John clip yep. not too long ago, but here's another artist going even deeper on publishing in general. And I guess, well, actually he's a songwriter. Like that's his thing, his thing. So I want to play this clip and then let's just talk about it and break down some more numbers for y'all. Money do you think is generated from a million streams? $4,700? Roughly forty-seven hundred dollars of that revenue, publishing revenue, eight nine hundred. Yeah, which means on a hit record, you're literally dividing that money amongst five, six other collaborators, and we don't get that money for a year to a year and a half. So what generally happens is we'll do what two hundred songs a year, and in those sessions, we're not getting paid to show up. We gotta get our own DoorDash. We got to pay for parking and you're launching blindfolded half court shots trying to make a basket so you can make $800. All right. So minus tax. <laughs> <laughs> $800 minus tax. So he actually said a couple things. And if y'all don't know, this guy is a 
two times Grammy Award winning um, person. I was actually was said on the video. He won two Grammys and he's a hit writing songwriter and producer. The more important part is the way he broke down fees and the process. So we know that it's a gamble in terms of if a song is going to do well or not. Yep. If it's going to hit a million streams or not. And he talked about how much the money money the song makes, but then you break it down to publishing. $800 in that particular scenario that he's breaking down. Now, you add in, I'm working with multiple people. Mm -hmm. So are we busting it down 50% because me and you worked on it? Or are we busting it down on some of these bigger records? Right? One tenth because it's 10 different writers on this thing. Yeah. Right? And the funny part about it is he's like, in this whole time, I'm paying for my pizza, you know, my parking, yeah. like this entire process, not knowing it is going to happen. So I have expenses coming out for a gamble. And that's why record labels move the way they move, right? Yeah. It's because I got expenses constantly going out and I need to make this money back in some way. So I got to limit the risk that I'm taking and increase the possibility that something's going to keep this thing moving, right? So I, I like the fact that he brought in the, those personal expenses into it because I think we don't even think about that enough or that's not enough of a part of the conversation. It's like, what are you doing in this meantime? And how much is it costing you in the meantime before you make that money back? So really, you make that $800. Let's just say you are the only one in that category. Did you just break even to pay for your pizza and parking over that period of time? All right. Or, or, and whatever else it took for you to maybe fly out if you had to fly out. Yeah. All right. Uber over there. Uber over there. And especially Uber in L.A. Golly, you know, that'd be $200 down and back sometimes <laughs> some, some trips I've taken. And then the worst part is, you know, you waiting a year to get that check. Yeah, to get the money, to get that. Huh? Like, that's the most disrespectful part. That's the way the industry <laughs> works. I didn't understand that shit. I remember um, when I first learned that I wasn't in the music industry yet, and I'm like, I don't understand. Yeah, because you know, I'm still in. At that time, I was working a job, got paid every two weeks. You know, I, I might have been still like bartending or something at that job. And I was happy because I had two different jobs that paid me two every, every two weeks, but it was getting paid every one week because yeah. they were staggered. <laughs> I was living that kind of life. And I'm like, bro, you doing what? You getting paid quarterly, maybe <laughs> yearly in some of these cases? I don't understand. Yeah, this right. makes no sense. Well, the first time we ever got hit with a net 90, that shit made me angry. Oh, I was like, nice. I was like 90 days to get paid for this work I'm doing today? For you? For you, yeah. No, this is your marketing. <laughs> that don't make sense. Yeah, exactly. So I get it, man. I 100% get it. And and then, and then to his point, it's like, man, you know, you don't really have that clarity of what's going to work because, you know, I've met lots of producers and songwriters that spend these same amount of fees, you know what I'm saying, put the same amount of work into the music that never comes out, right? Entity doesn't put enough um, juice into it to make it go as far as it needs to go to recoup for you, right? Like so many different things that affect the success of the song that have absolutely nothing um, to do with, or is absolutely out of your control as a producer slash songwriter, you right. know what I'm saying? Um, and so then it's, I don't know, it is interesting, man, because I, I did have a, this same conversation about, uh, you know, should songwriters get paid to be in the room with the songwriter homie of mine? She was saying like, she feels like, Songwriters should get paid like some type of like hourly work fee just to be in the session because of that. Like I could come, your argument could be, hey, you spend 10 hours on this session, this shit come out, blow up, you know what I'm saying? You make a million, but it's like, I could also spend 10 hours in this session, took me $50 to mm -hmm. get there, plus I spent 30 on lunch and then y'all shelf this shit and like nothing, you know what I'm saying? I get nothing from it. So I, I understood where she was coming from with that. I don't know if other songwriters and, and publishers are, you know what I'm saying? I don't know if they're like, that's something they're like actively fighting for, you know, I, um, personally. But it like makes sense when you think about like that context of it. Well, look, also when you got people to that argument being inefficient with their time too. So yeah, you showing really? up late, Yeah, you just chilling, yeah, drinking around. Got the Henny in there. You yeah. Know? yeah, so I'm just waiting. Hopefully something comes out and you just wasted an extra Four hours when this could have been a six hour session instead of a ten hour session. Yeah, I I get it. Yeah, that that I do get because we've all seen that. You know what I'm saying? I've been in some sessions like this shit could have been forty five minutes, bro. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, and then the interesting part. So when you relate this to the other conversation about the copyright royalty board, mm. so these stats. I just read this out. The royalty board accepted a music industry wide settlement 
that will improve songwriters streaming rates in the United States from January 1st to in 2023. The settlement known as phone records for mm -hmm. will see songwriters and music publishers pay a headline rate of 15.3%, all right, of a giving interactive streaming service. But that's by 2027, so it's going to work its way to that point. Now, it's going to start at 15.1% and then increase to 15.2% in 2024 here, and then slowly from there go up 0.05%. So what does that mean? That means literally, shoot, the way inflation is working now, it's going to be moving slower than the pace of inflation. So you're really just breaking even at where you were before. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's already long overdue. Like this hasn't been changed in a minute. Yeah. So you're still just trying to catch up. It's like, oh, I've been getting paid $5 an hour. And then, you know, you fast forward 20 years and people should be making maybe $15 an hour or something like that. Right. Well, I'm trying to catch up with this immediate jump. And even when I make the median jump, I'm not going to be caught up and still slowly lose ground as inflation occurs. So a win, no, but you know, well, to me, right, all around win. But you know what I said, right? I said the argument goes back to sports and what you see again and again. You have the NFL, NBA, they're pretty favorable. The ML, MLB, they're pretty favorable in comparison. But the NFL especially, notorious their agreements that they have for such a dangerous sport doesn't make sense. Like yeah. People not getting health care, yeah. contracts not guaranteed, all of these things. But you have a union or, or uh, I forgot what they call it. Um, they might not use the word union, but y'all have this collection of all the athletes. Right. And y'all come to these agreements. They do holdouts and strikes and, and like we're not going to play this season until we come to an agreement. So they've done this time and time again. They're still not getting guarantees. Why is that so hard? Because some of these players, it's weird. It's the middle class that suffers the most, which goes into society as a whole. The upper class, you got some of them that are willing to say, hey, I'm going to take a stand and try to increase this number for everybody. Because And I got the leverage and clout. Those are the ones you need the most, mm -hmm. right? But how inspired are they unless they're just mother Teresa and mlk nah i'm only gonna fight but so hard mm -hmm. because also because i have so much leverage and i'm in these great positions eh, we kind of built a relationship with some of these guys like i'm in good standing and i don't want to mess up my situation and make it too rocky by trying to fight too hard or too dirty yeah. to help the little guy yeah. in this scenario, exactly. right? Yeah. So I'm not going to hold out for so long. But here's the crazier part. Because a lot of people like to go to the people who have money or people on top and blame them the most. What you see is the ones on the bottom, and this is strictly more in the sports, especially like the NFL right now, and then we'll relate it back to the artists, but it's just the same thing. The ones on the bottom understand that there's a short time span to capitalize. And like the average career might be three years for a lot of people, or I need to prove myself and get on this team. So a lot of those guys actually don't want to hold out too much either. Cause individually it's like, what am I going to do? Take a stand for the future guy. Yeah. Cause stopping this shit right now will actually mean I never make money or I, cause I lose my opportunity. Yeah. So those guys are damn near fighting harder than the people who got the most money and the people in the middle are kind of just in the middle, never c coming up because you got the big guy who's already a big guy. And, you know, he he, he leveraging a little bit of his weight, but he's not going to fight for you to get everything you need. And you got the little guy that's like, look, bro, I can't think about tomorrow like that. I'm trying to think about today, make sure I get the money that I need to get. And yeah, you know, 300K might not seem like a lot to you, but that's a whole lot of money for where I'm at right now. Yeah. So it's that hard to, br to bring together these organizations where in football, it's very obvious everybody who's in the league, right? These are the players. These are all the people who matter. You're either in or you're out. All these people are on a team. In music, who is actually truly in music and a professional? I don't know, Drake. Right. <laughs> we, we got our stars, those people that we know, and some of the people they're connected with. But... What what 
are the terms? Do we just say, oh, you have to be in a label oh, okay, I guess for so. us to have yeah. a meeting yeah. and then try to come up with some terms and try to improve these terms together? Because there's a lot of artists who are just starting out today and they consider themselves pursuing it professionally. Like what, how do we know who we're in this boat with? At yeah. least those athletes know who they're in the boat with. I might not like half the artists. I don't know if they're on teams or like, like if they're really serious about their shit. Like, are we on the same level? How are they handling their business? Because mm -hmm. agreements are so different between people. Um, like, so it makes it really, really hard for artists to orchestrate something that is impactful. Yeah. For their for their own rights, publishers, whether whether it's on the published side, whether it's on a general deal side, whatever it is, the thing that has been most beneficial. For artists has not been artists standing up for themselves as much as we like to push this narrative of the Indian. That's what's bringing the leverage. The thing that's been most beneficial is the advent of the Internet bringing on social media and these things that literally change the landscape where you can do more without the label. And because of that, not only does that mean you can go longer without the label, but it also allows the label to look at things different too. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I don't need to invest in somebody early on. I can just wait because I can see them build up in real time. So I can lower my risk. And with that lower risk, that means I'm going to do less work and I want to take a more favorable deal for you. But because I didn't have to do that work that I would have had to do before, mm -hmm. not because I care about this indie stuff, mm -hmm. right? Like I could be somebody great at this company. Again, it's about the people, right? I could be one of these great people at the companies and say, yeah, I want to give you this deal because it's favorable. Go back to the accounting point apart department and they're like, hell you talking about, bro? We don't do that. Yeah. Those numbers don't work out, yeah. <laughs> right? So you're only able to do the deals because the accounting department who cares less about your well-being individually approve this at the label, Yeah, yeah right? It has yeah. nothing to do with this concept of <laughs> us taking a stand, right? Let's just leave it at that, right? It us taking a stand or having that mentality is really using the space that's already in the room, right? Yeah. Like, because the problem is most people are moving, they're sitting in this chair right now, right? And they're only taking advantage of everything that you can in this chair, where the reality is there's a full room here. I can get up and I can go to this corner, that corner, that corner, that corner. And now I'm taking advantage of the full space in the room. I'm not expanding the room. I'm not innovating the room. You know what I mean? I'm not building anything in the room. However, I'm now taking advantage of every part of it. So if I have a deal where this is the max that my accounting department as a record label is willing to pay you, but you agree to what you can get from this chair, the mentality that's stuck in there, that's your fault. But if you have enough education, you know, you pay attention to these conversations of, you know, value and understanding how things work. You can at least get up in this chair and get all of the money that comes with this room as a whole. All right. But that wasn't was that necessarily your leverage or the record label wanting to do good? Or was that just a record label finally saying, oh, OK, yeah, it was in our budget. You, mm -hmm. We just let you, well, you know, this job was budgeted for 120K, but you only asked for 100K. So why would I say no to that? Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, OK. You asked for 120K. Cool. That was in our budget anyway. And we just gave you what we already had set aside for you. If you yeah. actually had the <laughs> audacity or knowledge to ask for what you were worth. Yeah. Or, right? to, or to your point about them already being there, it's like, hey, what it took us a million to get you to this point. We didn't have to do that. So, yeah, man, take this extra. 200k 300k something like that take right? it yeah it's like why not yeah. yeah would have taken us that amount of money and we didn't have to take on the risk mm -hmm. because we could have put that amount of money and nothing happened mm -hmm. so why not right this is it's just it's just basic risk assessment and again to me that always goes back to just understanding the landscape that we're in the way that labels work today versus yesterday. You know, I'm big on distributors are the new record labels. Mm -hmm. That is the deal. Why is that the deal? Because what do record labels control traditionally? Primarily the marketing, right? And the distribution, which is a part of marketing, right? 
the marketing department indiv- individually that left. Yeah. But many of them can still take hold of distribution. They can't from a standpoint of like getting on Spotify, but we already know that it's more than that. All right. So we can control some distribution in some way. That's still our way of like keeping leverage in the game and then upstreaming you to other services because that's what it is, right? Mm-hmm. Like, oh yeah, we're gonna put you in this distribution service. And if you happen to be successful, now you're already in our system and we can do a better deal, which is beautiful for labels. To me, like this is a better fucking model for labels. That's the thing. People mm-hmm. talk bad on labels. This is a better like time for labels than ever, in my opinion. Like you look at one, where the numbers are going. So if you look at why they are investing so much money in the catalogs of these artists, based on streaming, yes, the numbers are tough now, but we also have to look at what I said earlier in the conversation. The Most of the population has not adopted streaming yet, mm-hmm. right? But these old people are going to get older and then you know what happens when you get older enough times, right? But these young people are going to get older too. Mm-hmm. And that means more young people. And these young people are all going to come into a streaming consumption mindset which means the whole pot of streaming gets bigger. Mm -hmm. So right now we're still in a trough. Like people are like, oh, music is so amazing. It's doing so awesome. We're not making the money that we were making in 2020. No, not 2020, in 2000 yet. Mm -hmm. Like I I forgot the number that it was around. Maybe like, I don't know, maybe like 30 billion or something like that, right? Last year, people were happy that it grew to 10 billion, like Mm -hmm. that type of thing, right? We're still at a low. But by like 2030-ish, they're projecting this shit's going to hit like 55 billion, the industry, based on streaming, right? So I'm getting in these catalogs because it's a great time for me to own these catalogs long term. Mm. I'm an investor. I can do that shit, right? Yeah. And it's also perfect timing because on the artist side, there's this tax bill that was going to like fuck them up anyway where they weren't able to cap. Right. Yeah. So that's why you're you're seeing this stuff. But it's great to be that because now not only can I do that as a label. Right. And or not as a label like that as an investor taking this music in the long term. But as a label, I also understand this industry is going crazy in the long term if you're willing to wait that out. So I'm in an age where as a distributor, I get partial control of your shit without doing shit in comparison to just signing you. That's a lower <laughs> effort agreement. Yeah. And you're happy with it? I'm happy with it, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, hey, okay, I only get 15% of your shit and you, I don't charge you anything to distribute this or I get, there's all kind of other agreements, right? There's some people who you got distributors who hey, say, hey, you can just pay $20 a month or $50 a year or whatever. We're not talk, even talking about those, but you got the ones who say, I want to get a little percentage. Uh, most of them are percentage, actually. Mm-hmm. Let's just, so let's Especially just stick the ones with that. Worth it down. We said what? Especially the ones that are worth it down. The ones that are worth it and they're, have yeah. a, they're a little bit more boutique. And then what, what, what varies, the percentage varies, right? 10%, yeah. 20%, whatever that looks like. And then I have all these tools, right? Because I'm here, you're now having somebody that, um, that might have more relationships. CD Baby's not really going to like move yeah. Yeah. any room around to make some playlisting yeah. culture happen for you. But um, who do I want to name? Let's just say Empire might, right? Empire can. Like that's that's let's put it that way. Yeah. Might do whether they do it or not, they can. Yeah. Right. In comparison to what a CD baby or somebody like that would do. Right. So you come into an agreement, it's based off percentage. You're happy with it because you own far more. It gives you more flexibility, but that also gives me less um of less responsibility. But the moment you start to really take off, I have the resources to be able to treat you like a record label. And those agreements change. They don't say the exact same. Mm-hmm. Like Oh, shoot, you taking off and now you're about to be the next Drake. OK, I got all these other resources. I'm going to approach you and say, hey, OK, we kind of given you some of these resources, but we could take this to the next level if you let us do this, that and the third. That's what many situations are having occur. 
And it makes the most sense for the label. Yeah. Low risk, you're already in agreement. I just did my ANRing, but I still did have to do heavy investing because I didn't know if you were going to win or not. All right. You, good agreement for you. So it's a closer to a win win because I don't want to make it sound like I'm just saying, hey, distributors are trash. I'm just saying that's a far more fruitful agreement. And then the indie culture is the same because I got the distributor right here. And then what are labels doing? They're in bed with a lot of distributors. I'm owning a lot of these distributors as a background. So there's some sort of a subsidiary or maybe I just have a, a, a ownership stake. Cool. On the other side, you just said it earlier, right? If you want a little bit more individual attention, what do you do? You go to an indie label. Mm -hmm. So those indie labels are the a &Rs, and that's where you get more attention. They can put more extra effort and energy into creating more of a star, right? But then you get upstream to the label. Mm -hmm. It's still that machine. So these labels, instead of being that major that people just go to and they say, hey, everybody, I want to go. Like Everybody wants to come straight to me. I create all of these new vehicles that eventually all lead back to me anyway. Mm -hmm. And they're just structures that lower my risk. Yeah. So yeah. like the way I think artists need to get not get caught up in this marketing idea of or propaganda. That's why I think it's propaganda <laughs> that we're destroying labels, overtaking labels. We're just in a completely different climate. Mm -hmm. Right. And labels have adjusted to the client and it's actually better for them as, <laughs> as much, just like it's better for you. Yeah. Right. Because it gives you more flexibility in decision making. Now, it's not a one on one mono a mono game. Better for you might not mean better for another artist because it's also your decision making along the way. Yeah. I'll leave it at that for for, for right now. But it, it's, it's crazy and it's interesting to, to observe from. You know, just the way these numbers work and how the game really maps out if you pay enough attention. Yeah, bro. It's like you can really see where the future's going. You can see where the future's <laughs> going, bro. It's and I'm gonna find that um that report when we hop off, bro, because it was a uh, Golden Sex that did the projection. It was in one of their reports. Oh yeah, I think it was one talking did, about. Yeah. yeah. And I remember looking at it before, but it wasn't until I looked back at it another time where I I looked at the projection of where music was going and when i saw that and i saw the whole curve i'm like ah ah mm. it's coming together yeah you know what i mean because you know how you'll look at something one time but it's not with a certain context and then you yeah. go through some experiences and you look back at that same you know you read the same book or you listen to the same song and this shit hits different like, oh, damn this shit makes so much sense it man. makes a, a total different level of sense at the moment so you know that's you know, just some of the thoughts of this episode today. This is yet again, episode 30, 32. Uh, let us know how y'all are liking some of this flow. We're going to keep evolving. As y'all uh, may notice, you know, we got this white background for those who haven't seen. And we're in process of flipping the studio uh, to, to, to make it look and feel interesting. I appreciate y'all who said that y'all fuck with the new look. But it's going uh, to get cuter. <laughs> it's, it's definitely gonna get a little bit cuter man we, we, we got higher standards for ourselves and this ain't it just yet um but yeah let us, let us know y'all's thoughts in the comments and if y'all make it this far we appreciate y'all as always y'all y'all the home team y'all the real ones the realest of ones and we do it for y'all i'm brandman sean i'm Corey, and we out peace